Hello, everybody. It is Jane Rachel, and I'm here today with an interview that's especially meaningful to me because it's with my brother, Steve, who's not only a doctor, but is going to share his journey with stage four pancreatic cancer, which takes us back to that awful summer about four years ago, over four years ago, which was one of the scariest times of my life. So I can't even imagine what it was like for my brother, Steve, my sister, Ma Nancy, and my nephew, Ryan. The first thing I did when I got the news is get on the internet, both my sister Faith and I did, to look up pancreatic cancer. And even though I'm very much an optimist, what I saw was dismal. There was, I think, a 1% survival rate for five years. So here we are though, over four years later, and Steve is living life and doing well with no evidence of cancer. So I'm hoping that the purpose today is to spread awareness on what people should do in regards to clinical trials and experimental treatment whenever they have a disease uh, with, a, with a poor prog prognosis. Um, and I'm also hoping to inspire and show that occasionally miracles can happen, especially when they're mixed with science. So Steve, thank you so much for sharing your story. And I'm just, you know, this is- Happy to share it. Thank you. I'm hoping we can get the word out and help other people because I've learned so much just from you, the fact that, that you're a doctor and then have gone through this yourself. So let's go back to, I think over four years now, four and a half years now. I, I hate really going back there, but I think it's important. What were some of the first signs or what made you even get tested for pancreatic cancer in the first place? Yeah, so July 2016, and I really didn't have that many signs. It was, I had some mild symptoms, a mild stomach ache for about a week. Um, and then I, you know, technical stuff, I noticed my urine was turning dark, which was unusual. And just being a doctor, I kind of knew that dark urine and stomach pain meant obstruction. Um, so rather quickly, I was able to get a CAT scan, which showed the cancer. So within one week of symptoms, actually the week before, um, I had been going to the gym. I'd been doing my Peloton bike. I mean, I was if you had asked me one week prior, I would say I'm probably the healthiest I've been in my entire life. Yeah. Um, How old were you? I forget. You were 50, uh, 55. And I, I remember yeah. you were way healthier than me. You were going to the gym. And I mean, my yeah. Because, you know, when I was young, I was kind of a scrawny kid who didn't work out and didn't exercise. But um, I remember that. Uh, yes. But um, no, I, you know, like, from, from about age 40 until age 55, I was working out regularly and um, health was perfect. Um, yeah. I, I had no health problems at all, like perfect cholesterol, perfect blood pressure, wow. you know, and did all my things you're supposed to do. I didn't smoke, um, got my colonoscopy like I was supposed to at age 50, and I was doing everything right. So it did kind of come as, as a real shock to me. I was not expecting... Uh, I've always always been healthy, so I wasn't expecting it at all. And you know, I used to say that we don't have that much cancer in our family history. Like I joke that there's other things in our family, like OCD. I'm like, but we don't have uh, cancer. Yeah, and I wasn't then, worried about cancer. You know, I yeah. And uh, then and just mild stomach pains. I don't I don't know that most people would think that means anything, but maybe the urine turning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So okay, so then you go, you get tested, and and what happens next? Well, as soon as I was told. I just assumed I'd be dead in a year. I, I, I you know, I kind of did. Once that I, you know, once it spreads. So I was stay, I was a relatively early stage four. Mine had spread to the lining of my abdomen. It hadn't spread to any major organs yet. But once it spreads, um, it's pretty much an incurable disease. And the one to two percent five year survival. Even those people don't make it ten years. It's just those people live longer but it's almost zero percent and from everything I knew I um it was not in my mind to fight I wasn't an optimist um and after two days of being really depressed I came up with the idea that I was just going to learn how to smoke pot and be high for the rest of my life I and it, a real calm came after over me it's like okay there's nothing you can do you're gonna die um Dying isn't so, living is kind of hard. It's very, living is very stressful. Yeah. Dying didn't seem to be that stressful. So it was kind of weird. I got really, really calm and really relaxed. And then, like, yeah, and my wife is looking at me like, 
why are you so happy all of a sudden? Um, it's like all my stress in life is over. Um, I wish uh, I had known that because I was, I, I, you know, I was obviously the whole family was devastated. And Faith, our, our sister and I, for some reason, we were convinced. We're like, nope, Steve is going to be the one to beat it. And to this day, I, I ask our mother, I'm like, you know, Steve and I just had a sense. And she was like, no, you were in denial because the, the, the results just didn't look good. Yeah. Um, and I, so I had no thought that I was going to beat it. That, that the, the thought that I can beat it really hadn't even crossed my mind at that point. Um, so, it was really Nancy, my wife, um, who, when I told her my plan, uh, that I was just going to smoke pot for the rest of my life and not work, she looked at me and like, nope, that's not what we're doing. Um, and really, I, I give my wife credit for saving my life. Uh, she's wow. the one during that first week who got on the phone. She made all the phone calls. First, she called all, all our friends. Uh, being a physician, I've got friends who are physicians and she would she called them to try and get connections so she found the best oncologist um locally who referred us to an oncologist in new york city and she got me set up with with appointments at johns hopkins and university of pennsylvania cornell i mean all in the first uh two weeks of diagnosis and she was doing that i was doing nothing i was just um calling my friends telling you know I, the smoking pot thing didn't go very far. I think I tried it once, but yeah. I told all my friends and I actually had a nice supply of it. Um, and that was like, and I'm like, okay, I'm going to do that. And now I, I did nothing to help myself at all for the first two weeks. It was really all my wife. And I give her all the credit for doing all of that. Yeah. Um, so do I thank, thank God for Nancy. So when, when did you have the first, I mean, even in people who do everything like Nancy it does, as you know, it's a one to 2% survival rate. When did you start that hope or what did you do next? Well, um, you know, it's hard to know when I actually had hope. I didn't really have real hope until um, probably two months later when um, my cancer started to shrink and, and things started to improve. Um, but the first glimmer of hope was looking to what was being done in clinical trials and, and uh, seeing, okay, even though there is no cure now, um, maybe the scientists are so close that uh, I'm gonna stay alive long enough. Um, Cause it, what really gave me hope, and this isn't actually what cured me. What gave me hope is different than what, was the immunotherapy trials that just a few years ago, um, people dying from stage four melanoma um, like Jimmy Carter, you know, I had the yeah. Jimmy Carter, right? I had the brain tumor and, yeah. you know, but he assumed he'd be dead in a year and he got this new immunotherapy that worked. Um, now immunotherapy has not worked for pancreatic cancer, but they were still working on it. And I heard Johns Hopkins was working on it. So I was like, okay, they're working on the immunotherapy. It worked just it was only a few years ago, you know, was it a dramatic change for melanoma? So I thought that's where I might have my best shot. Um, so I was looking to experiment. Um, I knew conventional therapy didn't work. And I think the mistake that so many people make in this situation, and so many doctors, is to try conventional therapy first. And then, because usually doctors refer people to clinical trials after the treatment fails. You do the conventional stuff, and then when that doesn't work, you go to clinical trials. But in pancreatic cancer, the conventional things never work. There was, there's, I mean, again, even that one to 2% that lives five years, they don't live for 10. So, um, so trying conventional treatment first didn't make sense to me at all. Um, I'm gonna stop you there just because that point is so important, right? That, that trying conventional first when you have a very poor prognosis doesn't make sense. And why is, is it because you lose time Wow. Right, right, right. Now, what I did was, now I want to say what I did was conventional plus experimental. Okay. So it wasn't that I just completely nixed. And I would absolutely uh, advise against avoiding conventional treatment when conventional treatment has a chance of working. Because conventional treatment is the treatment that is the most well studied and has the most, and if you reject something that has the most science for something that has less science, you're usually making a mistake. In fact, the one story I like to, you know, Steve Jobs, uh, who died of pancreatic cancer, um, his was caught in, a, in an early stage, stage one, where he still had a chance of a cure. 
And he said, no, I want to try alternative treatment first. And when that didn't work, it was too late. His cancer had already spread. So the decision to go alternative instead of conventional basically lost him the chance of saving his life. So I, the main point is never reject conventional treatment when conventional treatment has a chance of working because it far and away has the most science behind it. And, and I would never recommend anybody go experimental when there's a treatment that still has a chance of working. Um, unless you're adding to that, which is, you know, it's, it's one thing to, to reject conventional treatment. And another thing to say, I'm going to accept conventional treatment but I'm going to add something experimental on top of it to improve my odds. Um, yeah, that's that's reasonable. Okay. But really careful not to don't don't ever reject a treatment that has proven to have a chance of working. Um, so what I ended up doing. So again, I was in this dilemma. Once my wife convinced me I had to try, um, realized I had to experiment, and being a big big believer in science. Um, and, and, and the point I, I make about believing in science, the human body is just way too complicated to figure anything out without a whole lot of research. There are a lot of theories that sound really, really good. So, you know, people say, I mean, people were giving me all their theories and I'm like, oh, that's an interesting theory. And like, hmm, that, that, that seems to make a lot of sense. But without research, it, again, even things that seem to make sense on the surface, usually end up being wrong. Um, in the end, 99% of all medical theories get proven false. Wow. And the 1% that gets proven true almost always needs to be tweaked. So even, even if you get a theory that turns out to be true in the end, um, it still usually has to be tweaked in such a way to get it working. So you know, reaching for treatments that have really little science, uh, I would say has almost no hope at all. Um, okay. So, yeah. if now, first of all, I do want to clarify when you say experimental, we're not talking like, you know, some voodoo doll here. We're talking. Well, but that's what I, so that's what I'm saying. I believe in experimenting based on science. Okay. Whereas so many other people in the situation where they hear that conventional treatment doesn't work, they, those people are more likely to turn to the voodoo type treatment because they think, what, what other choices do they have? You know, if your doctor tells you this is not a curable condition, you, then the first instinct is, well, I'm just not going to listen to my doctor. I'm going to wait and find somebody who tells me it is curable. And then they usually do go to a voodoo doctor, um, some alternative holistic treatment, and end up spending so much money on things that have no chance of working. I mean, I, I really feel like these these doctors who are promoting this and, and taking money for it are, are real charlatans. Um, I mean, so many doctors have gotten rich, you know, prescribing treatment that has zero chance uh, of working. So it, it's a, again, people are very vulnerable. When, when you're told that you're dying, you're in an extremely vulnerable position. And there are so many people out there looking to take advantage of that. Um, so again, while I believe in experimenting, I want to experiment in science. Uh, so now, just to summa summa before we go, go ahead, ahead, to summarize that there, because I heard a bunch of things not to, which is if conventional treatment has any chance of working, don't, um, don't forego it, right? Exactly. And don't go to voodoo science. Or also, though, if conventional treatment has no shot of working, you do want to make sure that you add some experimental to it. Exactly. It's a little bit complicated. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I, I think I'm going to try to post some slides on this to explain it for the layperson. Okay. Um, because I do, it's like there's a lot of do, do's and don'ts. So it's like go with conventional if there's a chance it's going to work. If not, go to some sort of experimental with science behind it and maybe add it to conventional. So can you explain what do you mean by experimental? With okay. So, it? well, the whenever possible, whenever possible, the best way to do it is through clinical studies. Okay. I, I'm a huge, huge believer in clinical studies and I'd like to actually explain why. Um, before something gets to a clinical, uh, to a human trial, it needs to have shown a great deal of success in the laboratory. So that, you know, a whole bunch of scientists have cancer cells and test tubes and expose them to different things to figure out what works and what doesn't work. 
Um, so before anything gets to a trial, it needs to pass that phase. Um, and then it needs to pass the animal phase. So they have these mice where they start growing, you know, tumors in the mice, and then they can treat the mice with the treatment. And so before anything gets to the stage of a human clinical trial, it has shown success. So there's real science. Now, the scientific process isn't completed at that point. It's not completed until they finish a large scale, double blind, placebo controlled human trial that takes years and years to do. Um, but by the time it's gotten to the stage of a clinical trial, a lot of hard work has already been done. A lot of real science has already been done and clinical trials are really, really expensive. So in order to actually proceed, the scientists have to be optimistic enough that they're willing to spend and the people donating the money have to be the optimistic. So in order for a clinical trial to proceed, there's gotta be a lot of smart people, optimistic that they're willing to spend that kind of money and do that kind of work. So these are treatments that, that real scientists, like the smartest people out there, the, the biggest experts are gonna be the most enthusiastic. And if it's not in a trial, to me, it means the experts aren't as enthusiastic. So I wanna know, you know what, what are the best minds in the country? What do they think has the, have, has the best chance? If conventional doesn't work, what are the smartest people in the country studying this think is, is the thing that's most likely to work? And those are the things that are in clinical trials. And how hard is it to find it? I mean, you happen to be a doctor who also had a lot of connections with, with doctors, uh, like, you know. Yeah, it's not, the, it, there, there are organizations um, for pancreatic cancer. There's an organization called PANCAM um, and they're very helpful in, 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 in helping people find clinical trials. What I did find, which is warning out there is when you go to a great place, like let's say you go to Johns Hopkins or, uh, or you go to University of Pennsylvania and you ask them about clinical trials, they tell you about the trials they're doing. Um, and so, which are, uh, if it's Johns Hopkins, University of Pennsylvania, they're gonna be good trials. They're, they're definitely worth considering. Um, but if you wanna actually look at like all the trials in the country, um, a place like Pan PanCam is the best place to go. Um, they'll, they've got a team of advisors they're helping to advise people. Uh, and, and they advise people based on tests. So they can do tests like molecular profiling and see what clinical trial fits your molecular profile best. Um, so going through, I, PanCam is an organization I, I highly recommend for pancreatic cancer. And for people with other diseases, I'm sure there are similar organizations that help get people connected with, with the right trials. Um, but that would be certainly my, my best recommendation on how to experiment. And the main point there is don't wait. D d you know, start looking as soon as someone's diagnosed. Again, most, it, it's sad that most physicians make this mistake, but so many physicians do conventional treatment first and only when it fails. So and start looking immediately is the, probably the biggest point. Because I've actually heard several people say that they're like their numbers are going down on pancreatic cancer, right? With with conventional treatment, right? So they're they're doing they think they're doing well. So they're like, well, we won't turn to an experimental treatment or a clinical trial until this isn't working. And the mistake there is what by then six months to a year has passed. Right. So so um, cancer almost always becomes, especially pancreatic, almost always becomes resistant. Um, the tumor cells, for some reason, are really smart, and they figure out how to become resistant. So um, with pancreatic, about a third of the time, the chemotherapy works to actually start shrinking the, the tumor. The statistic I heard was about a third of the time, the chemo doesn't work at all. A third of the time, it, it works to slow the process down. And a third of the time, it actually starts working really well. About a third of the people on chemo uh, find that their, their tumor actually starts to shrink, their numbers start to come down. Um, and they're probably they're really excited, excited yeah, about yeah. it. And then six months later, the tumor builds up resistance and it stops working. And I, want, I don't want people to wait. Now, the tricky part is once you're on chemo that's working, then it becomes almost impossible to enroll in a trial. Oh, you can enroll in a trial before you start chemo 
or you can enroll in a trial after your chemo fails and you're looking to sue. But uh, clinical trials, they want to start fresh. They don't want to take it. If you're already doing well, you usually don't qualify for a trial at that point. Right. So that's kind of where my second piece of advice comes in. If you don't qualify for a trial, and, and again, the, the, the most common scenario not to, to, to qualify is that you're on a treatment that's working. Right. Um, because then it, 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 they can't study you because if you do well, they're like, well, you were doing well anyway. Um, so if you're on a treatment that's working and you want to add to that, because again, there are these treatments that can be added to chemotherapy, you don't have to stop your chemotherapy, you can do it in addition. Um, then the next, to me, the next step is to experiment with treatments that are in clinical trials without actually being in the trial yourself. Okay, but we're gonna go there next because I know that's yeah. what you did, but before that, I've also heard people say to me that they don't like clinical trials because what if they get the placebo? Is that a valid concern? That, that's a valid, that's absolutely a valid, a valid point. Um, a lot of these trials now, the placebo group is less than half. Um, so a lot of them have like three or four arms, like you can get one dose or the other dose and maybe 25% of people get placebo and 25% get one medicine. One. And the placebo group still gets chemotherapy. The placebo group is still getting treatment. They're getting the treatment that you would normally get if you weren't in a trial. So it's not that the, the placebo group isn't getting treated. They're getting the treatment that you would get if you went to an oncologist and say, I don't want to be in a trial. Okay. So they're still getting treated. They're just not getting the experimental treatment. Um, so. Uh, and don't, if it, isn't if there's evidence pretty quickly on that the treatment is working? Yeah. Don't... So if the, yeah, if, 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 if midway into the trial, um, the treatment appears to be working, they'll end the trial early and then they'll give the placebo group the real medicine. Okay. So yeah. before, I know we're hitting the same point over and over again, but I do think it's important before we move on. It's really important to look at these. If you've got a diagnosis for a disease that has a poor survival rate, you want to look at these clinical trials first, because if you wait and do conventional treatment, they're going to wait until that treatment fails before they take you for a clinical trial. And by then it's often too late. Right. Did I, did I summarize that? Right, yeah. right. I mean, that's why, and that's why most of these clinical trials, you know, people join when they have only a month to live. So I'm re reading the study like, oh, the drug was successful because the average person in the trial only lived two months, but the people who took the drug lived three. So looks like it's a successful trial. And that's because many, many people who sign up for these trials, it's like the very, very last thing they do before they die. It's like, okay, I got nothing left to do. Um, and so, yeah, my point is, um, get into the trials earlier um, while there is still a chance of actually, you know, if the medicine works, you might actually beat the disease. Yeah, because cancer every second counts. Yeah. You're doing it, yeah. you're doing the, the treatment. Okay. As your sister, I know you did not do a clinical trial. Why not? And what did you do instead? Well, but so I did, I ended up doing three experimental th things, um, which were all actually in trials. And, and actually one of the things I did, I did was actually part of a trial. It was not a blinded placebo controlled trial, but I used an experimental test and two experimental treatments. Um, so the experimental test was something called a chemosensitivity test where they take your cancer cells and expose them to a variety of chemotherapy agents and figure out which chemotherapy agent works best. Um, the, uh, and that's still experimental. Um, there's still work that, that trial is still, it got delayed for a while for, for some reason, they just restarted again. So we still don't actually have results, but, um, there are several different types of chemo that can be used in the current studies. It's almost a toss up. It's like, you can flip a coin to decide which uh, chemo it's like some, for some people, this chemo works for some people that chemo works. And when you look at the studies between the different, uh, chemos, it's, it's pretty close as to which one is, is better. So if you flip the coin, it, it actually would be not a bad way to decide between these different regiments. Um, yeah, and what they usually do is they'll like try one first and if it doesn't work two months later, then they'll try the other one. Um, so I figure an experimental test, worst case scenario, if the test was completely, completely useless, it would still be no worse than flipping a coin. Um, 
uh, so, and that was an experimental test and they had a little bit of research and a handful of people at that point showing that it was useful. Um, and I actually, that was actually part of a small trial. I did actually sign a consent form. At that point, it was not a placebo, it wasn't a large scale study, um, but that one actually was part of a clinical trial. Um, uh, but then I did these two medicines, um, both of which were in clinical trials separately. Um, um, well, one of them was about to start a clinical trial. So that trial hadn't started yet. It was about to start. So I couldn't, I couldn't enroll in that one because it was still months away from starting, but it, it was a planned clinical trial. Um, and then the two medicines I did were what's called repurposed drugs, which um, are medicines that are already FDA approved for other conditions. Um, so you can get it without being in a trial. You just need a physician to okay it. And since I'm a physician, I can actually was able to okay, I was okay, I was able to okay it myself. Um, so repurposed drugs. Um, and with COVID, I think a lot of people now know what repurposed drugs are. Um, so just using COVID as an example, um, uh, there were a ton of drugs already on the market. And since nothing, we don't have a treatment that works for COVID, doctors were trying all sorts of things. Um, uh, and most of them didn't work. You know, so way back at the beginning of back in March, they were trying hydroxychloroquine, they were trying Zithromax. Um, and in the end, okay, those proved, uh, I don't think they did any harm, um, but they ended up not working. But there are two drugs um, that have now gotten FDA emergency clearance um, to use in COVID. One is the Rendesivir, which was developed for Ebola, not for COVID. And so they started giving to that people um, um, and it had no side effects. So if it didn't work, no big deal, um, but it seems to have helped. Um, and there's one just a few weeks ago um, in arthritis uh, medicine that just got FDA approval for people with severe COVID. Um, and so these are repurposed drugs. Um, they're on the market. Um, any doctor can prescribe them. So again, with COVID, when people ended up in the hospital, it's the local infectious disease doctor said, well, let's try this, can't, let's try that. Yeah. Might as well try something. Uh, so these, um, so there are drugs like that for cancer. Um, there's cholesterol drugs, there's um, blood pressure medicines um, that have um, some evidence that they might help. Uh, you didn't pick drugs willy-nilly though. You both picked drugs. No, no, I, I, now, um, once mine started working, I did a lot of research on the subject. Um, but during the first few weeks, I, I got opinions from various doctors. I, the, the first doctor I went to was at Cornell and I found her specifically because my local oncologist said she's the only one that he knows of that's willing to discuss experimental treatment. Um, he said, if I went to, to you know, another place, um, well, they'll, they'll discuss a trial that they have, but other than their trial, they won't allow you to experiment. So my local doctor referred me to somebody in New York who was basically thinking the way I think, willing to try something that studies have shown, you know, it might be limited. You know, there might be a study on 30 people, which is not enough to get FDA approval, yeah. but if a study on 30 people shows that it might help and you can get it because it's already available on the market for something else. Um, so the, the first drug that this doctor suggested was an intravenous analog of vitamin D. It's not exactly vitamin D, but it's close and already on the market for using dialysis patients. Um, and they had done the research out in Salk Institute in California. So highly prestigious, you know, not a bunch of quacks. These are like super, super smart scientists, yeah. you know, who did the work and showed that it worked in the laboratory. It worked on the, the laboratory animals that they'd given it to. Um, and they were about to start a study um, in Boston, um, uh, you know, prestigious university there. Um, but that study was 
going to be started a few months and I didn't want to wait a few months. And she said, like, hey, the drug's already on the market. You know, it's used for dialysis. We can get it and start giving it to you now. And she had one other patient before me that was already doing it. And there's no evidence of any side effects at all from this drug. Um, So zero side effects. It's like, and you can take it in addition to anything else. So it wasn't instead of anything. So zero side effects. We'll figure what, you know, there was nothing to lose. Um, So that was one of the drugs that I took. Um, And I'm still taking at a lower dose, but now that, um, but I'm still taking that. So that's two things, the chemo, the physician. Right. And then the second one actually ended up being hydroxychloroquine, which again, Right. didn't work for COVID. Um, but the story there, I went to University of Pennsylvania and the entire appointment, they spent talking me, trying to talk me into a study that they were doing. And they were telling me how excited they were about this medicine. Um, and then they told me what the medicine was. And I'm like, oh, I know that medicine. Um, yeah, right? Isn't it- and, but they told me that, you know, if I was going to be in their study, I can't do anything else experimental. So I wouldn't have been able to do the experimental test that I wanted to do, wouldn't have been able to do the um, intravenous vitamin D analog, and I might get placebo. Um, so they wanted me to join their study. And again, I'm a big fan of studies, but I had already decided I wanted to do these two other experimental things. And they weren't going to let me experiment if, if plus be in their study. So at the end, I decided to just go home and write a prescription for myself, which is what I did. What you did. Uh, so now you're doing three things, right? You're doing the vitamin D. The... So I did one experimental test, two experimental treatments. Um, so the experimental test picked a chemotherapy regimen that was probably different than they would have given me. Um, um, it was really, would have been the second choice. So the test said to do the chemotherapy that would have been their second choice, not their first choice. So I, I did conventional chemotherapy, but conventional chemotherapy that would have been their second choice based on an experimental test, plus two experimental medicines. Um, and within one year, I was, my cancer was not detectable. And that's and just, so it, rare, right? Is yeah. that- so I mean- it, went, it went from the tumor marker. So there's a blood test called CA199 that, um, uh, during when you get cancer, that number goes up. Um, I started with my first number was eleven thousand five hundred. Normal's less than thirty five. Oh my god! Um, and I was eleven thousand five hundred when I got diagnosed. Oh my god. Within a year, it went to normal. Wow! Were your doctors in shock? Yeah, yeah. I mean, and, and uh, you know, e- even within a few months, the number was dropping so fast that everybody was. My my local oncologist said, you know, yeah, a third of the time the chemo works and people improve, but not this fast. Um, Mm. So the numbers dropped dramatically. And within a year, my numbers went to normal. And so I was diagnosed four and a half years ago. So it was three and a half years ago. So I've been no evidence of cancer um, for three and a half years. Oh my God. I just, sister, like every time you say that, my heart just gets to be, you know, so it's been no evidence of cancer for three and a half years. And that's unheard of, right? Pretty much. Oh, well, maybe one in a thousand. One in a thousand. And yeah. are they attributing that to your treatments or is there any chance? Nobody you- knows. Nobody. Nobody. You know, what, when, when you're dealing with one person, um, one in a thousand. So, you know, it, the success I had that I've had so far, yeah, maybe one in a thousand. But there are thousands of people diagnosed with cancer. So one in a thousand do, with, that does happen without experimental treatment. And all the other people are dead. So the one in a thousand, is the, they're the only people left alive to talk. And that's why the scientists look at you and say, well, I know you had a miraculous response, but what, you know, with conventional treatment, one in a thousand people do have a miraculous response. And those are the only people alive to talk about it. So it looks like, you know, so, so yeah, we don't know if you were just some magic miracle one or that made a difference. I could have just been a freak, a freak and just got lucky and maybe it wasn't the experimental uh, because we still don't know. So the, the study that University of Pennsylvania with the hydroxychloroquine, that study is complete and they had marginal success. Um, in that study, that was only people with stage four who were pretty... Uh, progressed, 
did not prolong survival. They got some um, what they call partial results. So they think that drug still might be useful, but only maybe mixed with other medicines um, or, or maybe if you catch it early, but it looks like hydroxychloroquine is not a great drug for pancreatic cancer. Um, again, it looks like it probably helps a little bit and they're still doing some research to decide whether selected people it would be useful for. So their studies are still ongoing, but it does not appear to be a miracle drug. And this vitamin D analog I'm taking, uh, we should know within a year. That study should be finished. Um, it also got delayed for some reason. Um, I don't know, research goes really slow. Uh, Maybe you need all of the things in combination. Is anyone studying the exact combination that you do? I'm, I'm working with researchers. Okay. So Fox Chase in Philadelphia, um, they contacted me a few years back because they wanted to study my success. Um, and I essentially talked them into to studying my, because I'm the only person that I know of that took those two in combination. Right. Maybe, so they're, they're being studied separately, but I'm thinking, and I have reasons to believe maybe the combination is better than separately. Right. Um, so I've been working with them and they think within the next few months to have this study started where they're going to use my two drugs plus a third one. They've added a blood pressure medicine that's also shown some success. So they're doing a study on three repurposed drugs plus chemo. And I've been in contact with those. So I'm, I've been in contact with a number of researchers I'm still very involved in the whole pancreatic cancer I'm world, so, trying to do what I can to help other people. I am so proud of you. In the beginning, yeah. we told people you were a doctor, but you're not a, a, an oncologist, you're an allergist. No, I'm not an oncologist, right. So my, my specialty is allergy and asthma, right. um, but I've been very active. I'm, I'm, I'm communicating with a number of researchers, working on design, designing clinical trials, uh, again, doing a number of things, trying to, you know, I'm just so grateful to be alive that I wanna be able to share my success um, with others. And I kind of dedicated the rest of my life to you know, helping other people have the success that I've had. Oh my God. I figure there's gotta be a reason why God saved my life. So I'm, I'm See, dedicating my life to work. I could with. jump through the screen right now and give yeah. you a hug. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I've been on this journey with you and I just, I am just so proud of you. And I am so grateful that, that you're not only alive, but you're living life and doing amazingly. Oh yeah. I, yeah. I, I, love, I mean, you're traveling, you're working and you're, you're now engaged in helping cancer research. I yeah, love I'm probably, I'm probably enjoying my life now than before then I got cancer. Do you think, uh, do you think it's changed your perspective? And, uh, and well, a little bit, I mean, a little bit, I'm, you know, now just being, ha just being alive is great. So now I'm just happy to be alive and, and all the little things in life don't bother me as much. Yeah. Um, but I also, when I get sick, I cut back my hours at work. Um, and now that I'm perfectly healthy, I decided I like working less hours. So um, that's made my life a little bit better, you know, working 26 hours a week instead of 50 hours a week that I was before. Um, uh, that and having, you know, again, and having a mission in life and, and things to do. So, yes. I'd, I'd love to end it right here, but I do feel like we'd be remiss if, if someone's watching this, who's just, they've gotten diagnosed with someone that they love that gotten diagnosed. I'm still not sure if they're not a doctor, right? I mean, cause what you did is very complicated. What, I mean, is there, do they go to a pan cam? Like, I mean, are, so, yeah, right. what do they do? So, so the, the two biggest advice, well, I love the organization pan cam and there are people there that can direct them to find clinical trials. Um, and then as far as finding a specialist, it should be a universe and well i guess the point is you can have more than one doctor if you have a and because i've heard this from people too it's like oh i love my doctor i don't want to go anywhere else I heard that yeah it's like well no i my local doctor is still the one that i actually go to um i think he's fantastic so uh he's the one that he actually told me to go to cornell and he said look into these trials at at hopkins and uh uh, so I still go to him, but he's a general oncologist. He's not a pancreatic cancer specialist. Um, so I, I haven't deserted him at all. Um, no, I think everybody should go to a university pancreatic cancer specialist okay. or whatever disease you have. Uh, this is my, for anybody with a disease, try and find a doctor at a university because they're usually legitimate doctors um, who super specialize. So a specialist is one thing, but at a university, 
you can specialize in things that you don't specialize in private practice because you wouldn't be busy enough. There's not enough, there's not enough people with a single type of cancer yeah. um, or a single disease to specialize in a single disease, but at a university, you can specialize in a disease. So anybody with a rare disease, I'm like, find the doctor who knows the most about your disease and get on a plane and go see him. If he's out in California, if the doctor who knows the most about your disease lives in California, fly to California and see that doctor. Um, I mean, the people, viewers of my website know about my health journey. So you made me leave New York City to go to Virginia to, to get help and it works. So right, right. I found yeah. a doctor who knows, and, and you, you know, again, finding the right doctors, again, there's so many quacks out there. So it's, it's really hard. I'm looking at things that they've published um, in real medical, you know, if they've got publications in real medical journals, then I know if they're, so that's a sign that they're legitimate working at a university instead of by themselves. Um, again, there's so many quacks. It's so hard to, to find doctors who are willing to experiment who are not a quack. Um, so I am looking at credentials and I'm looking at things that they've written, but putting your hands with, putting yourself in the hands of somebody who knows the most. Um, and in my case, I wanted somebody willing to experiment because there's some really smart people out there um, who are really not willing yeah. to, to experiment outside of a trial. Um, so I know the names. I mean, if anybody wanted to contact me, if you have anybody with stage four country, pancreatic cancer, um, I've got the names of a few doctors around the country um, who I think are fantastic and willing to think outside the box a little bit. Um, but it's number one is finding the, the best doctor. Um, so finding great doctors, and, and again, it's finding doctors. That's why it's not finding quacks and doing, you know, things, you know, oh, I read this on the internet. I read that on the internet. No, find the doctor who knows the most. And I would recommend, I would advise that you, you talk to more than one, because I've heard for a lot of people, they go to one doctor, maybe at a big name place, like, you know, phone Kettering or something like that, but they don't always tell them that like the chemo is working. Do they don't always tell them the chemo is going to be resistant or they don't always encourage the trial. So I think you need, even if you're at a big well, name, more than one. Yeah. I right, mean, yeah. big name places, I like big name places, um, but some of them are only in, as far as experimental, they're only interested in the trials they're doing. And if you don't fit to one of their trials, you don't have too many people at Sloan Kettering recommending that you go outside of their clinical trials. Um, but I still think it's, you still want a specialist at a big name place, but yes, yeah, so you can get more than one. You should, I, yeah, I would say go to more than one yeah. and also check out PanCam for their, for their trials. Yeah, so, um, I, I, I went to three and my, you know, the, 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 the guy Johns Hopkins was interested and he said, it's against our policy for me to give you this advice. And then he thought and he said, but I'm the chairman of the department, so I'm gonna tell you anyway. <laughs> That's awesome. uh, but he said it was against policy, you know, their, so against their policy to tell people to do these experimental treatments yeah. without being in a trial the way I said, so what, what you're doing is, you know, it's against our policy to, to, to tell people to do that. And he's like, but that's what I would do if I were you. So um, if anyone out there is dealing with stage four, four pancreatic cancer, you can reach me through this Jane Rachel website and I will pass it on to Steve because you are talking to people around the world. You know, oh yeah, I've been um, I, two to three people a week from around the. I've had emails from uh, most recent one was Singapore, China, and uh, a number from England. Um, I, I a lot of people from England. I, I somebody in England found me and then spread my name around. So, but I'm getting emails from around the world, and I answer all of them. Um, I have an email that's halfway written and I just fill in the blanks. And But if somebody contacts me, they, uh, I'm happy to share my information. And the, mainly I have names of doctors that I think are good around the country and names of experimental treatment. Um, um, the other thing at which I briefly didn't get to is if there is an experimental treatment that's in a trial and not FDA approved, um, you can go through the, the expanded access um, it's also called compassionate use. So a doctor can fill out a compassionate use form and get an experimental drug for somebody without being in a trial. And I've had a number of people that I've contacted have had their doctor do that. And because there are a few drugs now in stage three, phase three clinical, 
phase three clinical trials that look promising. Um, so if somebody wanted to take those drugs and didn't qualify for a trial, there are ways to get them. That's great. Anything I forgot to ask? I think we covered it all. No, I think that I think you got it all. Thank you so much, Stephen. I, I just I love you so much, and I'm just I'm so uh, grateful that you're still here. And I'm, I'm grateful for what you're doing and help share, sharing your story and everyone else's story with the world. That's 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 so wonderful. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. Thank